Welcome to Pensari Basketball Live. The Toronto Raptors played their final home game. They lost 140 to 123. It looked like it might have been going the other way in the first half. The Raptors came out to a blistering start. No one was more blistering, of course, tonight than Javon Freeman Liberty. Nice to see him. <clears throat> you know, you never know where these guys end up. You never know if this was his last game at Scotiabank. If it was, he played a great one. And the Raptors made it interesting for, you know, the 17, 18,000 people that made it out there. Good riddance to this season. And I'm looking forward to more stuff in the offseason, more building, more team building. And, you know, there were some highs in today's game. There was some interesting parts of it, of course, seeing a team like the Indiana Pacers kind of a barren now. You know, this was a team that made a lot of noise early in the season, Buddy healed. You know, um, a lot of the guys who were there, Bruce Brown, Jordan Noir, a lot of the guys that were a part of that team back then are no longer part of that team now. And you wonder, three first round draft picks, are they better off for the wear? I'm not sure they are. I'm not really sure they are. And I've had a lot of concerns about the Indiana Pacers. So we'll talk about the Indiana Pacers. We'll talk about, you know, where uh, we'll definitely talk about the East playoffs at some point. This is a call-in show. Definitely feel free to call in. First, let's go to the post-game live. This is also an interesting live because today will be our first big board. Uh, so a lot of people have been talking about draft coverage. Uh, somewhere around the 25 to 30 minute mark of this live after we're done discussing this game that was, we are definitely going to do a big board, which is 17 through 1. The Raptors currently are slated to pick 16th to 17th. So deduce from that what you will these are the two players obviously that i would take with the two first rounders that we have so let's go to the post game and let's listen to what javon freeman liberty fresh off a career high what he had to say and what darko ryakovich had to say let's get to it you set that tone in that first quarter it's always a nice thing to have uh, from your point guard what, uh, what was your mindset coming in with the start and uh, having the team in your hands there for a little bit um just to go out to play my game uh be aggressive don't try to go out of ordinary, um, do too much. Um, and just let the defense, I just take what the defense give me, honestly. Darko, Darko was mentioning, you know, trying to adjust to becoming a full-time point guard in the league is, is a bit of a process. Just from your perspective, balancing, being aggressive, looking for your own shot, but also making plays, how how's that been over these last couple months? Um, it's definitely going to be a process, uh, probably maybe a long process. Um, just coming out of college, just being like a scorer uh, and having a scoring mentality. Um, but I also think it's a great challenge for me, and I'm, you know, I'm ready to take on uh, the challenge and just go out there and do what I can. Javon, does uh, scoring a career high, is that an important benchmark to you, or do you look to other markers? Uh, it's okay. <laughs> well, I mean, we didn't get the win tonight, so that's all that matters. How did you avoid Physically, you sort of have the, the dimensions for it and obviously the skills for it. Um, mm, like I say, I always had like that niche to want to pass, want to get my teammates better, honestly. Um, so as I was growing up, I never wanted to be the main scorer. That's just how it just obviously happened. But I always want to get my team involved first. So, so what kind of like nuances are, are you kind of trying to learn both now that maybe you weren't, weren't part of your game earlier in your career or in college? Uh, the biggest thing is my voice. Uh, I'm kind of a quiet guy. Uh, I don't really say too much, but um, you know, in this league, you're gonna have to talk. You're gonna have to talk loud too. So uh, that's one of my biggest things is using my voice. Is it a matter of uh, becoming more comfortable using it, or being more confident with what needs to be said? Um, a mixture of both, honestly. Um, you always gotta have confidence in what you say, but also uh, you gotta uh, get them to listen. Also, so <laughs> yeah. Emmanuel's kind of done both roles at Kentucky and in the NBA. Is there stuff you learned from him? Um, definitely. Um, just backing up him. Um, he's a, he's one of the uh, greatest, uh, one of the top point guards in this league right now. Um, he's playing well, so I'm watching a lot of film on him, watching him each and every day. Um, I get to see him, so I'm definitely getting a uh, little bit of pieces of him just playing the game. As far as learning the point guard position, what do you think allows you to learn the fastest? Is it the film process? Is it working on, you know, skills individually, or is it game speed stuff? What do you find gives you the best chance at like developing it? Um, film and game speed stuff. Um, I feel like I feel like if I could watch film each and every day and just take 
things little by little in film and then use it out there um, in the game or before the game in my shoot around. Um, I feel like I'll be fine. When you're, when you're watching film, what's the first thing you've started to look for as far as like you get the directive from these guys, more point guard reps. What's the thing you started looking for more recently that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise? Um, actually, it's on my defensive side of the ball, um, pressing, pressing the ball, getting my hands, getting deflections, um, pressing guys up full court, um, and just using my speed. Is that like Coach Carter? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Darko, I mean, how do you sum up last home game of the year and you know, kind of how you guys went out? Um, Start uh, of the game, I thought that we uh, did really good job defensively. Our activity was really good. Uh, we forced them into tough shots. Uh, we uh, we did pretty good job in that first quarter, uh, first half, and generally, like for the whole whole game, the, our rebounding was the problem. It came down that they had uh, 37 uh, second chance points, and all the offensive rebounds they got, they actually converted those. So they, they shot very high percentage. Um, we were able to score 123 points and uh, to win the battle of scoring in the paint. Uh, but uh, still, uh, we got to do a much better job. Uh, first, uh, first half, actually 26 points and paid pretty solid. Second half allowed way too, too many points there uh, for them to score. Um, Yep. That's maybe the best that uh, Javon, Javon has looked. Yes. Certainly in that first quarter and again down the stretch. Uh, you know, is he showing more progress as a point guard prospect? Uh, he is uh, for sure. Uh, you know, uh, that's not position that he is used to playing a lot. So he's playing out of his position. He's getting adjusted. Uh, he's doing a really good job of trying to get us organized and uh, communication and learning on on, on the fly. And uh, especially that that first half and the first quarter, I thought that he did a really good job managing the team and running our office. Over the course of the season, how have you seen Javon develop from the start of the year till now? Yeah, I mean, uh, first time when we came up with the idea to have him play at point guard, uh, you know, for obvious reasons, for a point guard, his size is pretty good for like two, three, he's a little bit undersized there. And uh, uh, at the beginning, he he lost a lot of aggressiveness, you know, and, and that, that's his, that's his uh, you know, that's his uh, identity, being aggressive and scoring and attacking the paint. Um, so uh, he was getting more and more accustomed playing with a 9 of 5 uh, and um, he ended up being the best scorer in, uh, in the G League this year. Um, so he's now trying to find that aggressiveness by at the same, same time, time to run around the team. So I think he's coming along a long, uh, good way. What was the conversation like this morning when you told him he was going to be starting? Uh, so, I mean, we didn't go into, into depth regarding, uh, you know, him starting or not, but he's just like always ready when his opportunity is there. Ochai has shown quite a bit of promise defensively over the last few months. When you sit down with him next week and talk about emphasis <coughs> over the summer, what's going to be some of the things you want him to focus on on the offense? Um, I want him to be focusing this summer a lot on defense. You know, he needs really to embrace that role for our team to be defensive stopper, to really take uh, ownership on defensive side of the ball, to guard uh, everybody one through four, one through five. He showed ability to do that, um, but that, that has to go on, on, a, on another level. And then uh, offensively, I think uh, for him, it, it has to be pretty simple. You know, when you have open shot, shoot it. Uh, be really good at driving. Uh, when teams are short closing out to using more going catches instead of catching goes, um, to crash offensive glass, to set random pick and rolls to roll, and to be really, uh, to embrace the way we're playing on offensive end with the cuts and movements and all that. So uh, that's, that's gonna be really progression for him this summer and heading into the next year. How far do you think he is as a jump shooter? Like, do you think the shot needs a lot of work or is it just a matter of Repetition. I think it's the, the question of repetition. You actually like uh, he's shooting the ball in in the gym really well, like high percentages. Uh, um, every practice, every workout, like he's putting a lot of work. I think it's just like him starting to feel comfortable to do that in, in a game-like situation, and he needs to see a couple of those fall down. So you know that uh, not nothing is a substitute for for, for confidence. How do you teach a player to become a point guard in terms of Javon? Um, 
uh, that's that's not an easy one like uh, you, you know because uh, that's a long road. You you gotta learn how to manage your team, uh, how to run offense, how to communicate with your teammates. It's a long process, but but he's showing really good signs of willingness to be exposed, to be vulnerable, to learn, to fail, and to to grow through that process. Uh, I think it's just a question of a lot of lot of repetition. Um, he he's gonna have amazing summer, amazing opportunity ahead of him with another summer league opportunity. So it's gonna be a good opportunity for him to make that next uh, next jump probably a little bit soon but uh how's jordan aura uh, we'll need to see how he wakes up tomorrow morning. He's okay now. He says that he feels okay that he's going to be good, but we're going to see how he wakes up in the morning. All right. The Toronto Raptors have a game against the Brooklyn Nets coming up tomorrow. We'll see how that goes. Hopefully it's another loss, but at this point, um, the Memphis Grizzlies do manage to lose tonight to uh, the San Antonio Spurs. Brandon Clark is back, Canadian boy Brandon Clark. But Victor Wembanyama was pretty much the only guy playing for the Spurs, and it didn't matter because he's good enough to beat the Spurs at this point. That dude might be one of the best rookies of all time. I don't even think that's even an exaggeration. In terms of the Raptors tonight, Tyrese Halliburton had a very quiet 30 points on 10 for 16, very efficient. Um, you know, but what you're used to with Tyrese is 15 assists, 12 assists, and they kind of kept him at bay in terms of being a facilitator, getting into the middle of the floor. Um, and they made him more of a scorer. And, you know, to his credit, he was very efficient tonight. Obi Toppin was very efficient tonight as well. Very athletic, had a couple of big finishes. He's very hit or miss, a terrible defender, but offensively they needed him tonight and he showed up. I thought Isaiah Jackson was great for them in the 18 minutes he played. He had seven rebounds, including five offensive rebounds, really killed the Raptors, killed, you know, got around Kelly Olenek, RJ Barrett, et cetera. My player of the game, man, it's hard to not give this to TJ McConnell, man. He was really good, like in terms of organizing their offense and steadying everything up. And, you know, the, the Pacers really came out sleepwalking in this game. And they won that second quarter largely because of TJ McConnell, in my opinion, and Ben Shepard. I think those two guys really just had a huge impact off the bench for this team. Obi Toppin, of course, you know, the beneficiary scored a lot. Thought uh, Aaron Neesmith played a decent game. You know, defensively, he really racked up the pressure. I thought Pascal Siakam was a turnstile defensively, um, but offensively, you know, quite quiet game. Took 10 shots, 27 minutes. Obviously, Rick Carlisle was in, you know, he had no interest in playing his starters, you know, into the ground tonight. And yeah, uh, the second quarter came around. They broke 40 points. And at that point, you started to feel it. And then I looked up the record at halftime, what, what the Pacers record was after leading at the half, because they just narrowly led at the half. And I was just like, this game is curtains. And of course, they come out in the third quarter. They whooped the Raptors. So they won every single quarter except for the first quarter. But in that first quarter, you know, it's really hard to say <clears throat> what you're really seeing. You know, you saw a lot of downhill tax from RJ Barrett. You saw a ton of, you know, transition push play from uh, Javon Freeman Liberty. There was no Grady Dick tonight. Um, I think Jordan Nawara flashed some really interesting stuff off the bench. Um, you know, he had 11 points. Bruce Brown was great tonight. Uh, maybe a little bit of vengeance against his former team. And, you know, I think uh, I think Williams also had uh, some interesting moments. He missed some point blank stuff and he missed both his free throws. But just getting on the glass. You know, uh, the, the big block that he had, it was it was really um, something. And I think Jordan Noir had a really big block as well that was initially called to go town, but then got reversed back to a block. And I thought Ochai Abaji had probably the block of the night, even though he had a really poor scoring game. And I think, you know, the Raptors might be, I don't want to say second guessing themselves on, you know, trading for Ochai because, but man, like, the Pacers are a really bad team, okay? Defensively, this is one of the worst teams in the league. It's really bad. The fact that you go 0 for 6 against this team, can't really find a rhythm, can't really get anything off, don't make a single field goal in 29 minutes. This is tough. <clears throat> you know, Ochai has, like, nothing offensively in between. You know, the passing game is just not there. So he's not a playmaker, he's not a penetrator, he's not a shot creator. He's barely a shot finisher. Um, and if he's not cutting back door, 
And if he's not popping up for three in the corner, he's got nothing in his game. So we're talking like PJ Brown level offense. Uh, sorry, not PJ Brown. Wow. PJ Tucker level offensive player, uh, maybe worse because he's not quite the shooter yet. And defensively, you know, he's six foot four, six foot four and a half, you know, as a guard, guard wing. Really tough to pair a non scoring wing in this in this day and age in the NBA with a center who does not shoot in Yaka Pirtle and a superstar who isn't like a prototypical shot creator in Scotty Barnes. I think this is tough. And in fact, it's kind of interesting because everything on my big board gears towards, you know, best player available. But it's hard to ignore how much the Raptors could use a player like Ron Holland just because of Ochai Baji's deficiencies. <sighs> that being said, Ochai and RJ, I wish I could meld these two players into one player because tonight RJ had some really interesting takes to the basket. And the, my favorite sequence of the game probably was him taking Pascal off the dribble, one-on-one, mano-mano. The, the Miles Turner just had a very, very bad game, in my opinion. Like, he was god-awful. I know the points, rebounds, whatever, but he was just clumsy. He wasn't impactful. He didn't really, like, defend as well as you're used to seeing a guy like that. He was invisible. You know, like, yeah, you know, he, yeah, he scored six for 10 or whatever. I don't think he had a good game at all. I think he could have done much, much more tonight. If he had decided to exert himself, there's no way this game would have been close. Um, so he takes Pascal Siakam off the dribble. And that last gather step, he gets clear to the basket. And then the other side, down the court, Pascal Siakam tries to do the same thing to him. And the ball squirts out of his hands and goes out of bounds. Now, <laughs> frankly, these are both really not very good defenders. Siakam's not a good defender. Uh... RJ Barrett is a horrible defender, but I thought it was interesting that RJ found a way to score on the bigger Siakam, but Siakam could not score on RJ Barrett. And it was time and time again, you know, I think it happened a few times where he took him, just couldn't score. Yeah, of course, you know, in transition, Tyrese Halliburton, he's going to find you for a couple and you're going to get an offensive rebound here or there. And he did get five offensive rebounds because the Raptors were atrocious at defending and finding their matchup and you know generally boxing out and all that stuff and i think a lot of a lot of that comes down to just how many defensive liabilities you know are you willing to play on the court at the same time the raptors play a lot you know you have gary Trent jr who had a really cold shooting night oh for seven from three rj barrett oh for three <laughs> oh chayabashi oh for six uh, sorry oh for two i mean that's a lot of missed threes and again some of that is just luck some of those were open like wide open right I think you also get lucky. Ben Shepard, he went three for nine from three. He could have easily gone six for nine from three. So luck balances out both ways. I think the whistle was a little bit skewed towards the Pacers, if you want my honest opinion. And also, has anyone ever flopped more in a Raptors uniform than Kelly Olenek? This guy is foul baiting all the time. Not, not my stand up. It's not my style of basketball. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of foul baiting. Um, in terms of the team stats overall, Again, you know, um, the Raptors don't play a Raptors-y game. And by raptors -y game, you know, high assist numbers, a lot of, you know, movement. It was a lot more, you know, guy takes guy off the dribble. And, of course, the Pacers are pretty bad man-to-man. -man, apart from Aaron Neesmith and Jairus Walker, who doesn't play, and maybe a couple of players um, deeper in their bench. They're not really a great defensive team. They have breakdowns galore. The Raptors also had breakdown galore. You know, R.J. Barrett really... <laughs> You know, his awareness sometimes defensively is just, it's so bad. It's, people have such a strange habit when it comes to defense where they really, really focus on the point of attack stuff. And so if a guy kind of stays with the guy who drives on him, they're like, oh, that's a great defender. But then if the guy turns his head and allows his guy to cut back door, or if a guy just doesn't seal and lets a guy like get him underneath the basket for an easy dunk, they don't think that's bad defense. But it is bad defense. <laughs> it's such bad defense. So the Raptors really don't have a chance or a prayer in a game like this. Even when they were up like pretty big, like they were up by 10 or whatever. I was like, there's no way in hell. It's just not possible. You cannot, like the other team has to literally not care for you to win a game right now against a team like this. <clears throat> and I think, you know, the Pacers are kind of sputtering into the playoffs. I would not pick them to win a single round. I literally have them getting bounced in the plan, if they end up in the plan, I get them bouncing the plan. If they make the playoffs, they're done in one round. 
this is not like kudos to their management generally speaking i agree with a lot of them a lot of the moves that they've made um pascal siakam is not one of those moves that i agree with now obviously as a raptor fan i'm thrilled that they decided to take him on because it was one of the few destinations that he wanted to go to but man i don't i don't get it you know i really don't um i don't think they're necessarily a better team um going forward i don't think they're much much better off for it and you could argue yeah they're missing you know ben Sh- uh sorry they're missing benedict Matherin right now sure sure and now they're missing three first round picks as well and i think i don't really think they need those first round picks i just think that if you're gonna the player that they really needed was og i don't know man that's the guy they really needed on that team like i think he would have in terms of his ability to turn defense into offense and to ignite their fast break and to not really get in the way so much, like Siakam, you know, he needs his touches. It's a lot of isolation stuff. Kudos to him. He's kind of just trying to fit in. But, you know, when he's just fitting in, he doesn't do a lot of that defensive stuff that he used to do, you know, 2018, 2017 Siakam. He don't really have that anymore. And so he's a liability on that end to some extent. He's not say a liability, but he's not exactly a plus defender. And, you know, if he's not a plus defender, he's not a plus spacer. And, you know, yes, he's a plus offensive talent and, you know, plus isolation score. But maybe, you know, with Benedict Mathurin growing into it and Juris Walker eventually stepping into that role and Tyrese Halliburton, maybe that's not really what you needed. Um, I understand secondary creation. I was really... Um, I really understood the trade when they made it. I just, um, and he's been good. He's been better for them than he's been for, than he was for the Raptors per the numbers. But I just don't think long-term that it's going to be worth A, what they gave up and B, what they're going to have to pay to keep them. Um, Pacers take more shots. They get into the paint at will, but the Raptors got into the paint even more. 76 points for the Raptors in the paint. The Raptors lived in the paint. That was Javon Freeman Liberty. That was Kelly Olenek. It was a free-for-all. And, you know, when you think about two guys like Miles Turner and Pascal Siakam in the paint, you're like, how? How? You know, TJ McConnell's a pretty decent defender. Aaron Neesmith's a really good defender. How? How is this team so bad? Rick Carlisle's one of the best defensive coaches in the league. Jeez. Why is this team so bad? Why is this team so bad defensively? Um... Even when the Raptors played them, when we still had Siakam, I think Siakam scored like 36 points. It was like a season high at that point or something like that. It was just crazy how easy it was to score on this team. It does not help that Tyrese Halliburton just, <clears throat> he just dies on every screen, right? But I think the Pacers are an interesting example of how difficult it is to play negative defenders. And I think that leads me perfectly into my big draft board. I don't like players who don't play defense that's going to show up my draft board so without further ado let's get on my draft board i want to introduce the draft board by saying a few things first number one i have not watched every single player in this draft yet okay i'm catching up so consider this draft board a preliminary it is one through 17 eventually we're going to get we're going to get 60 to one we're going to get one through 60 we're going to get to that point you know to the point where I'm going to start ranking these players out. I want to watch full games. I want to get really obsessed with this. I want to get obsessed with this because this is the foundational work. Um, It's really good. I want to tell you why scouting is great. Um, Number one is great to increase your awareness of basketball in general. You're watching a lot of other teams play. You're seeing their sets. You're maybe catching on a lot of um, other players maybe that, you know, are going to come up in the draft cycle next year. There's a lot of that. There's also the foundational knowledge of, hey, like now you know more about these 60 players being drafted into the league than the average person who covers the Raptors, which is also great, right? You would have working knowledge of, I don't know, where Grady likes to shoot in college. You know, for instance, let's say like, I don't know, let's say I had done more of a deep dive last year. Maybe I would have more of an understanding of Brandon Miller today. Do you know what I mean? Like I would have like 12 games of having watched Brandon Miller instead of four games of watching Brandon Miller. So I think that that's important. 
And these players do inevitably come up again and again and again throughout the years. They come up in trade talks. They come up, you know, in free agency. And then you have that working knowledge to go back on. Be like, hey, you know, uh, Keontae George, I watched seven of his games. And then I watched four of his games. I just think more is better when it comes to understanding the game. And so I'm looking forward to really, really investing two to three, four hours every single day to learn more and more about these prospects. Even though, yes, this is not the sexiest draft and it is not the deepest draft, I do think it's one of the most interesting drafts because there's so many variables. There's so many variables. There's so much left open. So let's see where we landed up from 17 to 1. This is probably going to be very controversial. I'm much higher on some people than other people are. I'm much lower on some people than other people are. And afterwards, if you want to call in and talk about it, we can talk about it. Without further ado, this is this is 1.0. We're going to do 1.1. We're probably going to do 1.2. We're going to do 2.0. We're going to do 2.2. And hopefully by the time the draft comes around, we're going to have Rob's big board from 1 to 60, and it's going to be like 6.0. Every time through the discussion, through critique, through more film, it's going to get sharper and sharper. And then we can look back on it years from now and say how accurate we were. Okay, let's get to this.
That would be funny. Okay, so what'd y'all think? Um, let's talk about it. Okay, so I'm gonna turn off the the volume and I just kind of like start through this again and let's just talk through it. Okay, so I think that Isaiah Collier had a very up and down season at USC. I think that entire program was a bit of a mess, as evidenced by you know what happened after uh, after the season. But I think overall, he is a really tough guard. Um, I wonder how he will overall function in an offense that he has to space out and do other things. There's there's something about very ball-dominant AAU players and high school players that you never know how they're going to transition, especially when they don't exactly project as like superstars the next level. The role that he has is not the role that he will have. And he's also so physically developed that you almost wonder why he wasn't a little bit better. It's kind of like the Scoot Henderson effect, right? Scoot Henderson having a terrible rookie season is bad, but it's even worse when you consider how physically advanced he is for his size and for his age. And so I think that that does play into it. And I think going into this season, if you told anyone that Isaiah Collier was outside of the top seven, it would be kind of crazy. Um, Spooky Ghost Rider saying, Rob, what do you think San Antonio would give up if we got the number one pick? Would you take that resulting offer? (sighs) What do I think they would give up? I really don't know, man. I don't know what they would give up or if they really are interested in whoever the hell is number one. Because obviously, if we get number one, they still get three, four, five, whatever the hell. So maybe they'll still get their guy. I don't know. Um, So yeah, so I, I really... I think for a team like ours where shot creation is such a, you know, deficit at times, the offense gets a little bit stagnant. Um, It's not the worst idea in the world to invest in an athletic downhill, you know, guard who can do some of this stuff. Kyle Filipowski, personal biases aside, I hate Duke. (laughs) I hate Duke so much. I hate Duke. 
And I've already mentioned 500,000 times that I have a bit of a bias against tall white guys in the draft cycle. And so naturally, I have to go past a lot of biases to put him even this high because there's a lot of players that I put him over that I like probably more. Um, the reason that I put him this high is because his analytics are off the charts. Um, granted, he's a little bit older, but still, you know, um, his analytics are off the chart. His skill set is very, very future proof. And his defense got a lot better this year. From last year to this year, his defense was much better. He got better overall. He has a lot of advantages. When you think about it, he was the Duke offense. He was everything that went right with Duke. When you take a guy like this, and his game really does scale well to being a third, fourth, fifth option, right? So the best case scenario of this is a very, very, very good third option. And I think that that's really what this draft is going to come down to at some point is you're going to have to decide on a really, really high outcome third option who's really, really likely to be that third option versus a really, really shitty, unlikely first option. <laughs> and you're going to have to choose between those two types of players. And honestly, more often than not, the safer bet is the right bet. And Kyle Filipowski is going to be what he's going to be. He's going to be a role player. He's going to be a role player. He's not going to be a star. Um, Kalal, where uh, I have a lot of questions about his motor. There were games that I watched where entire quarters, he just felt really invisible. And for a player his size, <clears throat> with his length, he just wished that he was a little bit more dominant and a little bit more forceful. And I'm not really sure. Um, uh, Jap Cheat Singh saying, do you think they'll allow Dink to be in this draft? I do not but I have a really good solution for that. Also, shout outs to him. He retweeted me, which was really cool. A lot of people were like, yo, he retweeted you. Yes, he is very adamant about getting the word out about him wanting to reclassify. I don't think they're going to let him reclassify. He would be the youngest player in the league next year. There's no precedent for it to happen. And yes, he was promised two years with G League Ignite and G League Ignite disbanded. But that just means that, you know, he could just be in the G League. I have a workaround around this. Here's my solution for the NBA. Not that the NBA gives a shit what I have to say, but here's my solution. My solution would be that players who are younger, like high school age, should be able to be allowed into the draft. But if a team wants to draft them, they're not allowed to play in the NBA. They have to be, um, there's like a specific, so you have to use, a, you have to use one of your roster spots. Like your one of your two-way slots goes to that player, and that player has to be on G League assignment until they are of age. So, you know, for instance, you could draft him and he would have to play for the 905 next year. Why is that any worse than having to play? And he could earn an NBA salary, but he has to he has to play for the 905. He don't get, he don't get to play for the NBA. That would be so cool. You get, I mean, you could potentially have Cooper Flag coming into the draft this year. Instead of having to go to university, if you don't want to go to university, he could just go first overall in this draft, earn six, earn nine million dollars to go play in the G League. You think he might take that offer? Yeah. You think that might be really good for the G League? Yeah. So shit. Like I really, <laughs> yeah. Um. Where do I think he goes next year? I think he would go top eight, top eight. And I think if he came out this year, he'd go top three. Um, why G7 saying we need to leave this draft with a guard, a wing, and a big? In an ideal world, yes. So anyways, Kalal Ware, um, you know, and I really like his shooting potential. <clears throat> so again, if you, if you do the interview process with him, and you figure out, you know, that this motor stuff is not an issue for you, then, you know, this is definitely a player that has top 10 talent. He's absolutely going to be a role player. There's no like star potential here. Um, but he's, he's got, I don't know, Miles Turner-esque potential, um, you know, as a role player. And, and that, you know, in, in the upside upside that it actually works out, he's a very fluid athlete. Um <clears throat> Uh, for Salone, I haven't watched enough of his footage to make a really, really educated guess um, in terms of where he should go. And I have a feeling this <clears throat> he's going to move so much on my next big board. He's either going to be down to like the 20s 
or he's going to rise up to like six or five um, based on the next two games of his that I watch. I really am looking forward to it. He has some really intriguing potential, but I just don't see enough of an in-between game, physicality, toughness, fluidity. There's a lot of stuff that's missing, but he's also really young and he's playing against grown men. Um, he has the prototype of a draft bust for me. Like he, he, he reminds me of a lot of players who haven't worked out and I would be very, very curious to learn more about him. Um, interestingly enough, the player who goes right after him on my big board, which is Eves Missy also has a lot in common with a lot of players who haven't worked out in the draft. And for him, the process of getting to know him a little bit was actually very interesting. It was through a lot of interviews, it was through a lot of post-game stuff, it was through um, talking to a lot of people who followed Baylor more closely this year than I have and just getting an idea of who he has been around campus and stuff like that. So I walked away really in love with this. Like if he is our pick at 16, I am very, very, very happy. I have a feeling he will rise up as teams get to meet him. He is a very um, impressive human being, if you will. Um, he's very smart. He's very eloquent. He is extremely sharp. Uh, he does have some shooting potential. He's a really smart playmaker. I think he's underrated in that regard. He's pretty fluid as an athlete. Um, he has great measurables. So, man, like I am just very impressed with him overall. And I think if he goes back another year, he'll probably be a late lottery pick next year, which is saying, honestly, he's got he's got some upside. He's got some real upside and he's got like starting center potential for me, not backup big potential, but he's got solid starting center potential. Rob Dillingham. Um, look, man, I have a lot of issues with his size. Um, he's listed at six, three. I don't buy it um, with, <clears throat> you know, he's a dynamite shooter, movement shooter. Self-creation is great. He's a decent finisher. I worry how that will scale up at the next level. I think he's an okay passer. I don't think he's a great passer, though. I don't think he's a great passer at all. I think he makes delayed reads. I think his passes are off and off target. I think he sees things later than he should for a guy his size. His defense is atrocious. He does not try on defense. And I'm sorry. I just don't like him. I don't like him as a, as a prospect. It's not anything personal. It's just, yeah. The, the shot making is very impressive, though. Yes, he was very, very impressive in spurts. And I understand highlight culture is everything. And so some of the some of the, you know, the 30 point explosions or whatever that he had, they're going to leave you like, wow, this guy's like going to be a superstar. And it's like, eh, I don't think he's good enough playmaker to be a superstar. And I'm not sure he's quite. And I mean, like the best case scenario of him. Okay, Tyrese Maxey. But you know, like, you know what limits him from being Tyrese Maxey or someone like that is he not he not quite the athlete Tyrese Maxey was, number one. And he don't have the wingspan Tyrese Maxey did either. So on his finishes, I very much doubt, you know, um country Kong saying De deja vu with Keontae George. Bro, you want to check Keontae George's analytics? I know you've been talking about Keontae George all year. Keontae George did not have a good year this year, so just chill on that one. Um, like his stats next to Grady are like dead even. And I would say Keontae had a lot more opportunity than Grady this year to, to have the ball in his hands, to have a lot of assists, etc. It did not lead to winning for the Utah Jazz. Okay. Will it lead to the Utah? You know, has, have I been positively impressed with Keontae George? Is he better than I thought he would be? Sure. I, I definitely think he's better, but at no point is he going to turn into a positive defender. And I feel even more solidly that that's the case with Rob Dillingham. Rob Dillingham is a, a guy who in a normal draft goes in the 20s. Um, I just don't get it. So maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe I'll be wrong. You know, this is uh, definitely the type of player I often have a blind spot for. And so maybe I'm wrong. I just don't think that he has the size to be this type of player at the next level. Dalton, Dalton Connect is a 23-year-old uh, Juco progression, late bloomer, et cetera. Wasn't highly touted, but has a ton of potential as a self-creator, as a shot maker, as a playmaker, as a shooter, as a movement shooter. 
he can be a serious part of a playoff rotation right now. You drop him onto the Boston Celtics, plays 18 minutes a night, he's not going to kill you. This is a guy who can help you win next year if you want him. And if he falls to 16, the Raptors can probably get around six to eight million dollars worth of value out of him next year which is pretty impressive for a th- for a 16th overall pick i don't think he's going to fall to 16 because this draft is kind of weak and a player like him offers a little bit too much ready now potential for somebody reminds me a little bit of chris duarte in the sense that you know like he's an older rookie who's ready to contribute now but i think he has like real specialist upside he has some clay thompson in him he really does but defensively, he's a pylon. Um, does not move his uh, feet very well. He's a bit of a better athlete, like north-south, but east-west just doesn't have it. And didn't have great hands either, you know, defensively. And I think, like, when it comes down to... I mean, he's very coordinated, so it's, it's weird, right? Like, he has all the pathways to succeed because his hand-eye coordination and his balance is great. And I've often talked about balance being the great equalizer when it comes to... Um, you know, having not so great athletic tools, like you don't have a seven foot wingspan, you don't have a six foot eight, you know, size of the wing. So you're a little bit, I don't want to say he's undersized, he's six foot six with a probably six foot eight wingspan. He's not really undersized, he might even have a six nine wingspan. So he's not really undersized, but he's not oversized. And it's not like he's the greatest athlete. He's a good athlete. He's fluid, um, but he stays on balance. He's on balance and he's coordinated. He has really good hand-eye coordination. And I can feel that from just watching him uh, play basketball. He's a very natural hooper. All of his movements are natural. He finds a space. He goes into his space very well. Uh, Donovan Klingon, injury history. If you can get a clear medical on him, he is going to be a rotation big. I am not very sure if he's going to be a starting center in the NBA or if he's going to be a backup center. What I am positive about is that he will be a rotation center in the NBA. Um, A little bit of Walker Kessler is the lazy example or the lazy, you know, comp is is Walker Kessler because they're two tall white guys who block a lot of shots. But honestly, Walker Kessler was a much more prolific shot blocker. Um, I like his passing. occasionally he's flashed some shooting potential could he become a more um you know could he become a better shooter at the nba level could he get that three down to like he could take one to two a game well suddenly you know he's a better athlete than he gets credit for i feel he's a better transition player than people give him credit for he rolls really hard he's a really really good lob target i think he has like some serious starter potential as well and there's no way in hell that I'm putting you top 10 on my big board if you don't have starter potential at the five spot. Like, he definitely does. Um, No Jacoby Walter. So, Jacoby, I have to watch two more games on him before I have, like, any sort of, like, solid ground. But right now, he's 19th on my board. I have a feeling he'll move up, but I just haven't watched enough yet. Um, Cody Williams, <clears throat> I have gone as high as four on Cody Williams. I've gone as low as nine on Cody Williams. I think the swing skill really is the defense, um, and the shooting. How much do I buy the shooting on higher volume? Cause he does shoot pretty good percentages. Um, he's not like a great athlete. <laughs> he's not like super bursty. Um, but he is coordinated and he's really smooth and he, you know, he stays on balance again, the balance thing. I do think that if you look at his analytics as a freshman, they don't exactly scream top 10 freshman, you know, in a normal draft cycle, maybe he's like a 20th guy, maybe he's 22nd, maybe he's in that range for a normal draft cycle, maybe 17 to 20 would be a normal cycle. So this exact version of Cody Williams is in next year's draft. He's 17 to 20 for sure. But in this year's draft, you might go as high as five or six. And I think that that just really, really, um, I think that's really going to just come down to how teams project, you know, his defensive potential, switchability, um, his handle, his self-creation and his finishing ability at the rim. So a lot of things to work out and see. Um, I don't think he's nearly the 
freakish athlete that his um that his brother is and i think to some extent he is coasting a little bit off the success of his brother um but as we've seen with jalen and Jaden mcdaniels one should not always assume that brothers end up in the same space and i i'm a fan of cody williams but i'm not necessarily sure if i can get there where i can put him over stefan castle and, and these other guys in terms of stefan castle a lot of the cody williams stuff um he reminds me you know who he reminds me of he reminds me a little bit of case and wallace last year really really good at playing at his own pace he never gets sped up he doesn't do like crazy shit he doesn't play outside of himself he's always just himself and i find that really remarkable i have a feeling and this is just a feeling and i'm not trying to like react to the national championship and all that stuff i have a feeling that he's going to go top five and i have a feeling <laughs> that the raptors are going to benefit from it because somebody's going to fall into their lap but if he's the guy who's there at six i would have a hard time passing on him i know he's seventh right now but there's a really good chance that i would take him over somebody who's ahead of him right now and maybe even multiple guys who are ahead of him i've gone back and forth between him and ron, ron holland for number two you know i've gone as high as two on stefan castle i've gone as low as nine on stefan castle i've ended up at seven I think this is a fair place for him. I don't think it's fair to project star, superstar, or anything like that. But I do think that it is fair to project, you know, career like starter. And that's that's pretty good. You know, career starter is pretty good. Um, I think maybe, you know, a second team all defensive type of guy. It's also really hard for me not to think about the fact that the Raptors could really use a guy like this. You know, a point of attack defender who has this switchable ability. He is a little bit of a point forward as well. He does remind me a little bit of Case and Wallace. He reminds me a little bit also of Derek White. He has like something to him um, where maybe he's not going to be a star. He's not going to be a superstar. But I would peg his ceiling as a top 50 player in the NBA. And that is not something I can say about most players in this draft. So he might be higher by the time we get to version two, three, four, or whatever of this. He's just not a super athlete. And the jump shot is a mess right now but it's not a mess like that's 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 the percentages are a mess but he's confident when he takes it it's pretty consistent the mechanics are kind of there i just feel like you know he's a lot further as a shooter right now for uconn than scotty was at florida state and i was all over you know let's pick scotty let's pick scotty stefan castle has a lot of scotty stuff you know um will he graduate to being a primary facilitator maybe maybe um but he's definitely a connective one you know will he be like the defensive stopper that a herb jones or you know um an og and an ob is maybe not but he's definitely already like in my opinion very much squarely in the range of aaron neesmith you know what i mean so he is like okay in a normal draft stefan castle probably 13th to 16th right now you know what i mean like he's in the aj griffin um jordan hawkins that range you know grady dick that range of player but he could have upside as high as i don't want to say a man thompson and a sorry thompson but like maybe an anthony black i don't know he has some anthony black to him as well i think i would take anthony black over him but it's it's kind of in that it's close you know what i mean so he is a guy who i peg as a starter going forward that's just kind of how i am uh, how i am with stefan castle he is definitely i like him a lot um speaking of players that i like a lot um mathis bazelis like you know really coordinated really big playmaker i would not be surprised if this guy makes a couple all-star games and this is you know number six is where i get into wouldn't be surprised if they became an all-star that is right there and it starts with him it's a new range right um and it's partially because of his fluidity it's partially because of his size there's some shooting potential there there's also a lot of toughness there there's also a little bit of defensive potential there. There's a little bit of length and coordination. And, you know, like he he gets up there. Like he's not a super athlete, but he's a good athlete. Um, Alexander Starr is, to me, like if 
you tell me 10 years from now that he didn't get a second contract in the NBA, I'd be shocked. Um, let me put it this way. If you told me he had a six-year NBA career and he, and he amounted to a career backup, I wouldn't be surprised at all, okay? If you also told me, you know, three years from now that he was like a top 10, you know, big man defender in the NBA, also wouldn't be surprised. It could go one of two ways for him. I think there are things about his game that concern me and I need to figure this out. Madness, Country Kong. <sighs> Let me put it this way. You don't have a crystal ball, so relax. These are opinions. This is not madness. Chill, okay? I'll guarantee you right now, I've watched a lot more Alexander Starr than you have. So um, I understand that a lot of people want to put him first. I think this might be your overreaction to the fact that he's French and that he's big. And we just saw a guy who's French and really big dominate the league. And there's this immediate sort of knee-jerk reaction to find the next French guy who's going to be really big. And it does not surprise me that three of the guys in this draft are mocked, you know, really high and they're long, tall French guys. Not surprising at all. And for all three of them, the hype is warranted for the most part. They are good young players. This is, I, I called it last year, you know, with Bilal Koulibaly and, uh, you know, Victor Wembanyama. This is the French revolution of basketball. You know, this is a French uh, reemergence or revolution. And, you know, it's going to be a really exciting time for French basketball. I'm not really sure Alexander Starr projects as anything more than a role player at the NBA level. I don't see a star player. I don't see Evan Mobley. I watched a lot of Evan Mobley at USC. I watched a lot of him in AAU. I saw a much, much, much better prospect than Alexander Starr. So Alexander Starr being mocked as a top one player in this draft, the next Evan Mobley, et cetera, et cetera. I promise you right now, if he was actually Evan Mobley, if the real Evan Mobley was in this draft, there would be no question about who was going number one in this draft. I promise you that. There's no chance in hell that Ron Holland, Zachary Wiesache, um, Ben Shepard, sorry, um, Reed Shepard, or any one of these players would actually be ranked ahead of Evan, Evan Mobley in an actual draft. So we're talking about a poor man's Evan Mobley. A very poor man's Evan Mobley, who might remind you on some possessions of an Evan Mobley because of how he moves. But again, when you start getting dazzled by seven foot one and the wingspan and the coordination, I am more concerned about the basketball IQ, the grit, the toughness, the will, the shooting potential is there. Yes. Um, yeah, sure. You know, he has the tools. He has the tools. You know who else had the tools? Alexei Agensa had tools. You know, he was seven foot two. He could shoot the basketball, etc. Yo, it takes a lot more than tools to make it in the NBA, in my opinion. It takes a lot of IQ. It takes a lot of grit. It takes a lot of hours. It takes a lot of toughness. It takes a lot of cultural integration. You know, you have to be integrated in the locker room. You have to get along with people. You have to navigate the politics of the NBA. You have to have, you know, some real tangible skills. You have to work through different situations. You know, if if all it was was physical skills, you've seen Bruno Caboclo, right? Bruno Caboclo, I watch him from time to time in in Serbia playing right now. He can shoot the basketball. He's a seven foot seven wingspan. He's six foot nine, and he can run the floor like a gazelle. Why is he not? If that Bruno Caboclo, like let's just say, let me give you an example. Bruno Caboclo right now playing for playing in Serbia. If I just fucking I don't know faked his face. And put him into this draft as some random prospect and just said, look, there's Bruno Sanchez. I don't know. It's just like, let's just say we 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 changed his face up and we put him in this draft and we we told everyone he was 19 years old and you watched him play, he'd be the number one pick in this draft by far. By far, the number one pick in this draft. Like not even close. Like not even close with the way that guy's playing right now. Why is he not in the NBA? Why is he not in the NBA? If he's so good. He's better than everyone in this class right now. Why is he not in the NBA? You know what I mean? He can shoot. He can block shots. He can rebound. He can, you know, defend. He can switch out to the perimeter a little bit. He has all the tools. He don't have the consistency. He don't have the toughness sometimes. He don't have the basketball IQ. He don't have the feel. He just doesn't get it. You know, Andre Stajakovic, uh, which is uh, Paige's, yeah, Paige's son, six foot seven, very much a better athlete than his father. Um, I've watched him play a lot. He is currently mocked 50th in the 2026 draft, if I'm not mistaken. 50th. 
he's such a fluid athlete relative to his father you know he's he's got some kick ass to his game he's got the bloodlines he's got all this stuff to him you don't see the game very well it's just my opinion his father saw the game really well Pedro Stagovic saw the game really well he's also got like three inches on him stuff like that you know so there's so many things you know that go into making a player great in the nba level and i just think with alexander Sar, there's so many pluses for him the fact that he's not running away with the number one overall pick across the board the fact that it's not consensus number one pick he's got a seven foot six wingspan seven foot five wingspan he's seven seven feet tall he shoots threes and he's not consensus number one pick in a weak draft you gotta think about that really hard what is it that you're ignoring about him. I keep thinking about that. <sighs> yeah. Okay, let's move on. Um, now we get into the territory. As I said, this is, you know, if Alexander Starr makes an all-star team, not going to be a surprise. I, I'll be a little bit surprised, <clears throat> but it's possible. He has the upside. He has the upside to be an all-star. He has the upside to be, you know, 16 point, 13 rebound, two and a half to three blocks per game type of guy. And that is an all-star in the NBA. You know, that, that can be an all-star. Nikola Topic, like I think his jump shot is the big swing factor, but I also think his uh, defense is not great. But his ability to counter, his ability to see the game, his ability to stay on balance, his ability to get to the rim, his athleticism, you know, downhill gravity, I mean, this is like a taller TJ McConnell. You know what I mean? I think that's like the that's the worst case scenario for Nicole Top, which is like a taller TJ McConnell with more pizzazz and skill and upside. That sounds like a pretty damn good player. That sounds like a that's a, that sounds like a 12 year starter in the NBA. You know what I mean? Yeah, he didn't shoot three so well. But he'll find ways to score. He's very crafty. He gets to the spots really well. He invites contact. Super tough. Impacts winning in a million different ways. I know people are down on him, but man, he was number one on this, uh, you know, in this class for a little while, and then he got injured. Um, some people see Luka Doncic. I do not. I do not see Luka Doncic in him at all. Don't put those pressures on him. He's not going to be that type of player. But uh goran dragic a taller tj mcconnell like someone like that i could definitely see stuff like that from him he's a very good player he's a very good player and again when it comes down to you know floor ceiling arguments etc you know i think there has to be some sort of floor consideration for floor it can't just all be upside it can't just all be theoretical upside in which case you know you do take bruno caboclo number one in the in, in the nba draft right you might take Darko Milicic over, you know, a Carmelo Anthony. If it's all about upside, if it's everything upside, no consideration for floor, then yeah, you bat upside. But I don't think that you need to bat upside even higher in the draft. I think you do need to consider floor. You need to consider what is, you know, if this player doesn't get better. You know, this is a good, good, good example for life as well as it is for basketball. You know, a lot of us walk into relationships, either friendships, jobs, etc., and we idealize everything. You know, we ask ourselves, we idealize things. We, we say, you know, yeah, I could date her. And maybe when we start dating, she'll start taking better care of herself. Or maybe she'll stop smoking. Or, you know, maybe she'll get better friends. Or maybe she'll be a little less annoying. Or, you know, maybe she'll lose a little bit of weight. Or maybe she'll gain a little bit of weight. I don't know. Like you see her and then you visualize what else you would change. I think one of the things that I realized was when you meet people, ask yourself, what if nothing ever changes about this person? Could you still tolerate it? And that's how I like to look at prospects too. If this guy doesn't get significantly better at anything, is he still a serviceable player for you? And with Topic, he is a serviceable player for you. He is a much better player than Javon Freeman Lardy or Malachi Flynn or Delano Banton or whatever. Like he's got he's got some Delano Banton in his game, actually. Um he's either going to be a six man you know, a really good six man. Uh, he's got a little bit of, uh, you know, on the very, very, very extreme upside, he's going to be like a multi-time all-star. He's going to be like a Manu Ginobili type. That's going to be the extreme upside. 
the extreme upside is not Luka Doncic. This is not a generational, you know, one of one type of, you know, take over the league, win multiple MVPs type of guy. But it is a type of guy who could, again, in the absolute best case scenario, be a six time all star, five time all star. And I don't, I will never say that he can't do that. He can do that. Some things are going to have to work in his favor. He's going to have to end up in the right situation. He's going to have to have the ball in his hands. He's going to have to have cutters around him. He's going to have to have a lot of defense around him to cover up for the fact that he don't really defend that well. Um, he's going to have to commit to getting better defensively. Um, Nathan saying better at prospect than Denny of Dia coming out. Very similar, actually, in terms of maximum upside. I was a big Denny of Dia fan, though. Reed Shepard. Reed is my favorite player in this draft, actually. <laughs> That's really funny because I've, I've said so often that I have this little bias against, you know, white guys in the draft. And I keep saying this, and then yet Reed Shepard ends up being my favorite player in this draft. And then by favorite player, I just mean just so interesting to watch, so interesting to explore, not only because he looks like a guy that you might see playing in the YMCA. But I think that's what makes him so fascinating. What makes him so fascinating is the ways in which he succeeds. He succeeds through his mind. He succeeds through his hands. He succeeds through his effort. He succeeds through angles and coordination and balance and hand-eye coordination. Um, someone explain this Reed Shepard thing. What do you want explained? <laughs> I think... Reed Shepard is like, I think he's going to slip. I really hope he does slip. For the Raptors' sake, I hope he slips right to six and that we nab him and that we never look back and that it's the greatest decision we ever make. He fits really well with Scotty. Yeah, he lacks a little bit of that playmaking, you know, that super playmaking potential. Yeah, he lacks some of the shot creation potential. He doesn't have like the necessarily the razzle dazzle of the Nikola Topic, and he doesn't really have the shot creation and the step back hezzy pull ups of the Rob Dillinghams. And he's not quite the defender that Stefan Castle is, but man, he's got something. And that something is he's got vision for the game. And that sounds like a cop out, but it's not a cop out. This dude has eyes in the back of his head. He don't understand like, he understands the game on like M Magnus Carlson playing chess level. He really thinks the game out. He understands angles. He understands everything. He don't know. He knows what the game plan is going to be. He was not the most highly touted freshman coming into Kentucky. He was the third most highly touted freshman coming to Kentucky. And by the end of the year, one could argue he was the best freshman in the country. He came in as the third best freshman on his own fucking team. Okay. His parents are incredible basketball players. His mom was an absolutely incredible basketball player. They're both Kentucky legends. He grew up in Kentucky. Yeah, he sounds a little funny. He sounds a little funny. You want my, you want my honest uh, city boy opinion? As a guy who grew up in New York and lives in Toronto right now, he sounds a little bit of uh, he sounds a little bit funny. And I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are going to overlook him because he has a goofy haircut and he's a white dude who sounds a little bit funny. And he plays not like super sexy. You know, he doesn't have like a super flashy style of basketball, but man, he gets to his fucking spots. He gets to his spots. <laughs> and um, I can't tell you how fucking impressive his numbers are. Like his analytics profile being where it is as a freshman at Kentucky as a guard is so ab it's insane. We went through it in last night's live where we went through all the Kentucky guards. He he beats all of them. He beats Tyrese Maxey. He beats De'Aaron Fox. He beats Devin Booker. He beats all of them. In terms of like where he is analytically, he don't make mistakes. And yeah, he's not a great, he's not a great defender yet, but I think he could become a much better one. He has great hands. You know what I mean? He has great hands. And he has this like, he has this Lonzo Ball-esque ability. He reminds me a lot of Lonzo Ball, by the way. Lonzo is one of my favorite players in the NBA. Um, he has this incredible ability to spark like runs 
when he's on the court. Uh, you're just better because he's on your team. Like you're going to win more games because he's on your team. And I realize that a lot of people are just going to look at the last game against Oakland and they're gonna be like, oh my God, he didn't play well. That has a lot to do with Oakland. That has a lot to do with their defense. That has a lot to do with their scheme and whatever. But I'm telling you, man, this guy is not a guy who faded against better competition this year. Um, his shot blocking is impressive for a guy his size. Um, his tenacity, his his grit, his work hardness, whatever you want to call that. Um, his gym rat ability. Find me a guy who sees the game and works really hard and stays on balance all the time and can shoot. And I'll find you a successful NBA player. Worst case scenario, this guy is like one of the best eighth men in the NBA for 15 years. Okay. So that's your worst case scenario. Best case scenario, he's like a really, really souped up version of Derek Fisher meets. Lonzo Ball, you know, I don't know, I don't know how else to describe him. Um, like a champion, like a starting point guard on a championship team, and um, you know, he plays 13, 14 years and he makes a couple all star games, and yeah, just a really balanced analytic starling has like six boxes minus at his peak year, something like that. So, not a superstar, not an MVP. Not a first team all NBA guy, but just a guy. You know, Tyrese Halliburton, that's like, I don't say he's going to be Tyrese Halliburton, but the same stuff I'm saying about him is the same stuff I felt about Tyrese Halliburton. Not the same player, not the same player type, but the same idea. The idea is someone overcoming some of their perceptive limitations because of how well they understand and see the game because of how slow the game is for them relative to everything around them. You understand, if you're moving in slow motion and everyone else is moving in constant motion, you're ahead of the game. He is always ahead of the game. So I like him a lot. There's a lot I like about him. And yeah. In terms of uh, the perfect fit for the Raptors, it's Ron Holland. It's not even close. This is the guy. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he's number one on the Raptors board, honestly. like It's between him and Zachary Rissache. Um, in terms of the guys who would fit the need the most, in terms of the guys who have the most upside. Um, they're the only two guys, and they are in a league of their own, in my opinion, where they have like they are like there's like a one percent chance that both those guys could be all NBA guys. That's it. Those two guys that I have identified so far. Those are the only two guys in this draft that I can see. Ron Holland, Zachary Rissachet, where I'm like, okay, if every single thing breaks right for this guy, he could be a second-team All-NBA guy. I don't feel that way about Reed Shepard. I don't feel that way about Nicole Topic. I don't really feel that way about Alexander Starr. I don't feel that way about Stefan Castle. I just feel like in a draft in which upside is somewhat starved, you have to ask yourself, and this is where I said, go, go, go to the philosophical debate right down the middle. What is the philosophical debate? The philosophical debate is Zachary Rissache can be a bust. Ron Holland can be a bust. I don't think Reed Shepard and Nikola Topic can be busts. The problem is they have glaring holes that cannot probably that probably will never be addressed that will limit them from being superstars. And these other guys they don't really have holes that limit them from being superstars. There's nothing about Ron Holland. If you watch him play, you know, in the G League Ignite, if you watched him play this past year, there's nothing about him that says this guy can't be a superstar. There's nothing stopping him from being a superstar. I mean, there's a lot technically stopping him from being a superstar in terms of skill development, IQ, you know, all that stuff. But it's like he has a superstar physique type of thing you know what i mean like he like it's like jalen brown it's it's the exact same thing jalen brown can be a superstar is jalen brown a superstar your guess is as good as mine i don't think he's a superstar um tyreek evans he could have been a superstar larry hughes could have been a superstar you know what i mean like these guys have these like frames in which they're athletic and they have the the tools and the size and the skill and the package and all that stuff um, 
does he play defense? Yes, he does. They both play defense, and that's exactly it. They're complete players. So Ron Holland um, is a pretty good defender, I would say. Um, and Zachary Sache has like crazy defensive potential. Um, so I think that overall, like, sorry, um, I'm trying to read these comments here. Give me one second here. Also, I, th I think that it's fair to say that there are some guys who may go back. Um, so this draft could get watered down a little bit. Again, like when you look at when you look at the totality of you know how a player projects, it's really hard to scale up like what you saw from a guy in AAU versus what you see from a guy in the G League Ignite versus what you see from a guy in the Big Ten. Like, I really don't think that you can mess. Zach doesn't project to be a plus defender. Are you saying Zachary Risa does not project to be a plus defender? On what planet does he not project to be a plus defender? He's a very switchable defender. I don't get this at all. If anything, he might be like... No, I, I don't agree with that at all. Um, he has really good coordination. He has really flexible hips. Um, <clears throat> Zach is dirty. Okay. Um, yeah, I also think like a lot of people are making a lot of his shooting dip, but his shooting dip came with the concussion. So I think there's something to that as well. Look, I think as we go through this process, I'm probably going to get like a lot higher on Jacoby Walter, probably going to get a little bit lower on some guys as well um you know specifically someone like ron holland i think i could go as low as like 10 on him and that's the cool thing about this draft is that one week you know you could be as high as number two on someone maybe by the end of it i do end up with alex star in my top three i doubt i'll end up with him as my number one player um <clears throat> oh my god oh you're talking about zach Eady. Sar has the most upside. Again, what is upside? <laughs> Why do we feel Alexander Sar has the most upside? I think it just comes down to this. You've seen that player type succeed in the NBA. That's it. That's what it is. You've seen the Bam out of bios. You've seen, you know, the Jaron Jackson Juniors. You've seen the Miles Turners. And you've seen the Evan Mobleys. And you think that's what he looks like. And that's the thing. You know, um, I think that that sometimes skews how people see players because maybe you've also seen, you know, it's not lost on me that Reed Shepard kind of looks like a guy who maybe plays in China right now, who a lot of people were really, really hype about. And I promise you, he's not the same player as that guy, but a lot of people are going to, um, Reset defensive rating is 103. Oh my God. How are you judging an 18 year old kid playing against grown men? How are you doing that? Like, I'm just curious. Like, 
I don't get it. It's really, really difficult to do this. Like you can't, like you have to have like different analytics models for, for different, um, for, for different leagues. Like you cannot just, <clears throat> you have to go up against, like defense is going to be a subject of who you're going up against. And I'm sorry, like he doesn't have the physical advantages in terms of toughness and size or whatever and age relative to the competition that he's going up against. But if he was in the NCAA, like all bets are off. Like I have a feeling that he would be, you know, JLA maybe is saying if I had number one pick, I'm taking Risache. I think a lot of people would, ma'am. I think a lot of people would because he seems like the most number one pick type guy, you know? Um, and that's not to say that he'll be the best player. It just means that he has the clearest path to be the best player. And <clears throat> I think that's probably like the best way to look at drafts, which is you have to you have to accept the certain element of um I don't know. You know what I mean? Like there has to be some element of this is not completely in my control. Um like with with Ron Holland. You know, is he going to be a really good shooter at some point? How do you know? You know what I mean? You had a guy go from high school and right to the pros. The G League Ignite program is not great. It's not, it's never been great for preparing, preparing guys. Every single person who's coming out of the G League Ignite program from Jonathan Kaminga to, um, you know, Jalen Green to, um, gosh, Alaska boy, fuck. Dacian Nix, like none of these guys have ever been like really prepared and they never come into the league like really knowing what to do and how to play. And so you do wonder, like, is he going to be um, suffering in that same sense? Right. And, you know, how much of an adjustment was it for him to jump from being a high school player playing from the high school three point line to going to the NBA, uh, NBA three point line and playing against pros every single day? You know, um, there's different schools of thought on this for sure. Um, same thing with Risache, you know, it's like a lot of people are are saying, you know, the numbers have dipped, but what happens when we get to workouts and he comes into the gym and he hits like, I don't know, 22 of 25 threes and he looks a little bit stronger and he's filled out a little bit and, you know, he measures a little bit taller than they were expecting. Like either expecting him to measure six, eight, what if he measures six, 10 and he's moving around like a crazy person, right? Like it's the same thing with Jacoby Walter. You know, um, there is some concern about, you know, is he a little bit undersized as a wing? Um, what if he measures him at 6'6 six, six instead of 6'5? Like, I think these things are going to swing, you know, a lot of things in, in favor. Um, you know, it's the same thing with Jared McCain. It's, it's guys like this, like Jared McCain measures him at 6'4, and we're having a completely different conversation. You know, it's the same thing with Tristan Da Silva. If he blows away, you know, his, uh, his pro day, like we could be talking about a slightly different player. So there's a lot of movement here. And I think that the interesting thing for the Raptors is, as I said before, most of the teams that are picking ahead of you don't know what they're doing. That includes Detroit, that includes Charlotte, you know, and uh, yeah, the, you know, okay, yeah, there's, there's potentially Utah or whatever, but um Um, you know what's interesting? Here's something funny. Pull this up for you. So this is uh this is the Ringers mock draft. Kevin O'Connor. And this is uh let's see what this is. I believe this is I don't I don't I don't know if he's updating it every single day, but this is what's this? Updated 4.4. Huh. That is interesting. So this is uh, this is his mock draft, and he has the Raptors with the number one overall pick, which is really interesting. So they win the draft in this case, but 
you know, in terms of the Charlotte Hornets, the Detroit Pistons, there are a lot of teams at the top of the draft that usually don't know what they're doing, the Washington Wizards, et cetera. And the Raptors will pick ahead uh, behind most of those teams. So, yeah, there's a really good chance that they pick somebody, they reach for somebody that the Raptors wouldn't have. And there's a really good chance, you know, every single, you know, draft you go in with your big board, right? The Raptors went in with their big board in 2021. And I believe very firmly that Scotty Barnes was top three on their big board. And they got him at four because the Houston Rockets or the Detroit Pistons or the Cleveland Cavaliers pick somebody that the Raptors had behind Scotty. And so you end up with a top three player at four. So this time, maybe you end up with a top three player on your board at six. We'll see. The six, does Reese second half shootings concern you? Nope. It does not concern me. Uh, number one, the only thing that concerns me is how useless he seemed when his shot isn't going down, but I buy his shot. I think his preparation is great. His mechanics are great. His fluidity is great. I really like it. Um, Zachary Sache, Brandon Ingram comparison. Hell to the fucking no. No, I don't see any. I don't see Brandon Ingram. Um, does Rissache turning down in practice against Bazellas run you the wrong wrong day? Um, I did not hear about that. I did not hear about that. Um, which is interesting. Uh, let's just see where he has Rissache. So he has Reed Shepard all the way down at eight. Cody Williams at nine. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know. There's a there's a little bit, a little bit of Jabari Smith potentially in Zachary Rusoche. Um and if he can get there, that would be a hell of a, you know, um a player. Bazellas called him out in an interview recently. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, that guy doesn't know basketball with that mock draft. Hmm. Uh, where did you have Topic? I had him top five. I think I had him number four. Oh, so you were talking about Zachary Sasha. You weren't talking about Zach Eady. Um, I remain unconvinced on Zach. Zero shot creation. <sighs> Your comments bother me for the sense that they sound so sure. You sound so sure of yourself. And it just, it bothers me because you just, you don't know. Um, this guy has him at 10. You know what? He could be the 15th best player in this draft. He could be the best player in this draft. None of us really know. So it's like, it's good to approach this with a little bit of humility as opposed to this very blunt force. This guy's trash. That guy's trash. It's like, I promise you, you don't have the time, nor have you done enough research, nor do you know enough about basketball to be able to convincingly tell somebody that this guy's trash or this guy's trash. You can be like, in my opinion, I don't like what I saw and just move on. You don't have to have such hot takes about every single thing and such like rigid opinions because I tell you like when you have such rigid opinions, that's why you end up talking about fucking Keontae George a year later. You know what I mean? Like you just, just make your brain a little bit more flexible. And I think, um, you'll probably, I don't know, live longer and be happier. Anyways, um, it seems about as good a time as any to end this live. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Definitely talk a little bit more about the draft. The, the Raptors do lose to the Pacers, which kind of sucks, kind of sucks, um, because, you know, obviously that, that worsens the Raptors, um, that worsens the Pacers pick. And of course the Raptors did have a little bit of cushion, but at least now <clears throat> the Raptors don't have to lose three straight. They can still win one of these games against either the Nets tomorrow or the two games against Miami which would be really cool. Honestly, I would love to see Scotty Barnes come back for those two games against Miami. It'll be at home. It'll be in front of his home crowd. He was caught shooting around um, earlier today. I think it'd be really nice for him. And honestly, just get him in one game and let him score 26 points and let him finish the year averaging 20, 20 points per game. He's averaging 19.9 something. And it's such an annoying number. And just want to see him be a 20 point per game scorer. Is that is that stupid? Is that is that completely trivial? Does it matter to anybody else but me? Probably not. But whatever, man. Just let Scotty have one game. 
he's not going to get, I mean, I want to say not going to get injured because that's, you know, tempting fate, but it, it's not the end of the world. And if he's healthy, let him play like one game, you know? Anyway, it's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Yes. Good. I'm glad you acknowledged that. Anyways. All right. Have a good one, guys. Take care. Have a good night and make sure to hit like on your way out. I'd really appreciate it.